So this morning what we're going to do, I wanted to, to kind of combine a couple things here that have been working working through my consciousness this week. And of course, this is Thanksgiving. This is the time of the year when, <clears throat> when by holiday, by law, uh, in, our, in our country, and of course other countries have similar holidays on different dates, but this is, a, this is a time that was set aside, and the idea was that uh, we should pause. We, we Americans, we should pause, and we should give thanks. We should count our blessings, and we should give thanks. And that's good enough. That's good enough. You know, it's good as far as it goes. Let me put it that way. It's good as far as it goes, but, but there's so much more to it that we want to consider. And then we also need to, to kind of be realistic in what happens in our culture in our society, which is, as we know, very much caught up into materialism. And <clears throat> we have taken this idea of, the simple idea of pausing and acknowledging, acknowledging the gifts that we have received, the gifts that we are allowed to participate in, and we've turned it into a commercial holiday. You know, it's a day of, it's a day of football games and Black Friday sales and, and everybody trampling one another to get into the stores to see who can buy something the cheapest and probably turn right around and sell it, see if they can make money. So like other holidays, when we get into the commercial aspects of it, we have lost, we have lost the spiritual meaning, we have lost kind of the feeling, the, the, the essence or the sentiment of the holiday. So what I like to do at this time of the year is to bring us back to an understanding, an understanding of what Thanksgiving is, what gratitude is, you know, and and to understand it as a spiritual practice, <clears throat> as as Eric Bur Butterworth would tell us, a causative energy. I think it was Plato or, or Socrates said that that a grateful heart is a great heart that attracts to itself great things. And Florence Scovel Shin says that life is a game of boomerangs. What we toss out, we get back. The New Testament tells us, cast your bread upon the waters, and, and they shall come back to you. Isaiah says, my word shall not return unto me void. We have all of these, all of these different um, teachers who are pointing us to the fact that what we give out, we get back. What we turn our attention to sets the tone of, of the life that we live. And gratitude as a spiritual practice is a way of attuning ourselves, attuning our consciousness into, into the goodness that already exists, into the greatness that already exists, into the love that is everywhere present. And that's more important than football games and great sales and it's more important than something that we should only do once a year. It's something that Thanksgiving is every day. Every day is a day to count our blessings. Every day is a day to celebrate the goodness of God. And in, in addition to that, in addition to kind of bringing us back to some of these ideas about what do we mean by Thanksgiving? What do we mean by gratitude? Why is it important? All good, all good questions in themselves. I wanted to to start out by talking a little bit about vision, the power of vision. When I was working with uh, not-for-profit boards, church boards, th things like that, <clears throat> we used to do a, a workshop, it would last a day, sometimes two days, and it was about the power of vision. And we would get the, the leaders of the organization, the board members, uh, the 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 key contributors to the organization would come together. We would go on a retreat somewhere, you know, just somewhere where we could have privacy for a couple of days. I loved doing them at the beach. It was, it was fantastic. And we would start off by asking people to consider the question, what is the vision of this organization? And we would define the vision as, what is it that we're becoming together? What is it that we're growing into together. So, so the vision is never complete. It's not a goal that you're going to get to in 30, 60, or 90 days. But the vision is more more overriding than a goal. A goal is something that you do in fulfillment of your vision, but the vision is what is it that we are becoming? 
What is it that we are becoming today? What is it that we are becoming in the future? Can we define it today? And it was very important to get the people together, the leaders together, to, to, to see if they agreed on that, to see if they had a common understanding. Right? Because the leader's role in, in, in the organization was to enroll people in the vision, to, get, to, to help people understand what the shared vision of the organization was all about. So people could then decide if, if, that, if that met with their personal vision, if that was something that they, they saw themselves fitting into and participating in, or if not, if, if they wanted to go someplace else. And you may recall in the Old Testament, there's a quote that says, where there is no, where there is no vision, people perish. Where there is no vision, people perish. And other translations have that as, where there is no leadership, people perish. And the way that I would explain it is, it is the function of leadership, it is the function of the leadership, whether it be leadership in an organization or the leadership in your own life. Who am I? Why am I here? You know, the leadership that you provide to yourself it is the function of leadership to provide that vision, to help that vision to develop and then to enroll people into it. And it is this desire, it is this, this burning desire that is instilled in individuals and in an organization, the burning desire to, to live in that vision, to, to grow into that vision. That's what keeps an organization thriving, and that's why if there's no vision, the people perish. And if you contra we contrasted that you had the vision of what it is that you're becoming together, what you're growing into together, and then you had, you had the current reality. And the current reality is, is the way it looks right now, the way it looks. We have this vision of what we're becoming, and then we have the, the dire details of the way it looks. And of course, the, the two never match. There's always a gap between them. And this is important. There must be a gap between them. There should be a gap between them. I think there's a quote that says, if, if man's reach cannot exceed his grasp, what's a heaven for? We should always be moving towards something that we have not yet achieved. That is the purpose of the vision. It, it, it serves as a guiding force to be moving us forward, to be bringing us, to, if, if we want to consider it this way, to be bringing us toward itself. Now, when we consider this, just just briefly, I'll, I'll just kind of mention when we get into kind of forgiveness. I usually would will say if if somebody's feeling bad about something that they've done, you know, they didn't they didn't do the best that they knew. I always remind them, but you did the best you could. You did the best you were capable of at the time. And people get confused, and they say, but I knew better, and I didn't do better. Yes, we know better, because that's what we're growing into. But we do what we're capable of doing. As we grow into that vision, we become more capable of doing, doing more, doing better. That's how we grow. So I, I just mention that because sometimes people get frustrated. They say, oh, I've got this great vision. I've got you know, this, this great vision of what, what could be, this great possibility, but I, I can't, can't do that yet. And that's okay. You always have a greater vision of what you could be. That is what you are growing into. So in organizational dynamics, what happens is if if the desire to stay in the current reality exceeds the desire to move into the to the vision, the organization doesn't grow in our own lives, in our in our individual lives. If our, if our desire to become more than what we are today does not exceed our desire to just stay right where we are today, we too will not grow. So vision, when we think of vision, vision is very important because it is that power. It is, it is that power which, which keeps, us, keeps pulling us toward itself. 
keeps pulling us further along. What are we becoming together? What are we becoming individually? Every day are we becoming more and more aware of the presence and the activity of God in our lives? Is that what we're becoming? Every day we're becoming more and more a greater instrument of God's love? Is that what we're becoming? I can't answer for you. You have to answer for yourself. But there should be this idea of what it is that I am becoming. What it is that I am becoming. And status quo or current reality and just, just chilling and staying in things as they are. I mean, You can do that. We can all do that. We have all done that. But it does not provide us with growth. We need to have that vision of what we're becoming. We need to be moving toward that vision every day. So the power of vision in our spiritual life lives is very important. What we give our attention to is very important. <clears throat> when Isaac Newton uh, was a student at Cambridge, the story goes, he wasn't exceptionally gifted with intelligence. In other words, it, he might have not have been what they would consider the smartest student in the class, but yet he went on to become the chair, the department chair, and he went on to make great discoveries. And somebody asked him later in his life, and he said, what, what was it? What was it about you that that made you move into these these other positions and do these things? With with the inference that you know there were others who may have been brighter than you. And his response was, "I intended my mind. I intended my mind." He he had a vision. You see, he he set his mind toward a vision. Emma Curtis Hopkins relates the story of one of the popes who as a young boy taking <laughs> taking care of the the sheep in the field he had a vision that he would be the the pope of rome someday and he did he grew up and he became the pope and there's this there's this this power of vision what is it you're giving your intention to what is it you have your vision cast upon what is it that is pulling you forward. Now we as, as human beings, whether we realize it or not, we have a choice. We have a choice of what we give our vision to. Now here's, here's kind of an interesting thought. Uh, Hegel, the, the philosopher, tells us that before we think of something, we put our gaze upon it. Before we think of something, we put our gaze upon it. We turn, we turn our vision towards it. Now, this might be what the the Buddhist would call the original, the original self. Right? We perceive it, but we haven't yet labeled it. We haven't yet started to to put our names on it, to put our prejudices on it, to put our attitudes on it. It is just there. It is just there and we see it. We have our, it's in our vision. And then we start to, to weigh it down, if you will. We start, we start to, to give all of our opinions and we start to weigh it down. So what we want to, to do is two things. We, we want to recognize what is it that we're giving our vision to? We have a choice, you see. We have a choice. There's an old poem that you read a lot of in motivational books. And it says, two, two men looked out from prison bars. One saw mud, the other stars. And where is your vision? Are you looking down into the muck and the mire and the drama of the human experience? Or, is, or have we turned our vision upward, upwards? As scripture tells us, I've lifted mine eyes up unto the hills from whence my help comes. Are we looking to humanity or are we looking to God? What is it that we put our vision upon? <coughs> Excuse me. And rather than trying to label, identify, name the thing that we're looking at, can we be willing to to just see it as it is? <coughs> Excuse me, can I get some water?
excuse me. The heat's been running in the air. It's very dry in here. Are we willing to look at it and just <clears throat> see it as it is? Not as we think it is, not as we think it ought to be, but as it is. And this is very important when we start to think about turning our vision towards God. Because God is ineffable, indescribable. The word God is, is merely an audible symbol of a concept. And each one of us holds a different concept of what God is. And God is not any of those. Neti neti. Not this, not that. Not your concept. The Tao tells us the Tao that can be named is not the real Tao. In Buddhism, we're told, if you meet the Buddha on the road, kill him. Because he's not the real Buddha. It's just your concept, you see. So we have to be willing, first of all, to, to deliberately cast our vision into a higher realm, into a higher experience and to be comfortable without naming it. To be comfortable without trying to to describe it. To label it. I think I've mentioned this in the in the past. One time uh, when we were studying for the ministry uh, the topic of of ancient Egyptian religions came up and similarities between the ancient Egyptian religions and and some of the modern religions. And I got interested in it and I decided to go read a little bit because I went to a uh, parochial school and we didn't, we didn't study, <laughs> study things like that very much. We studied our own religion but not others. And when I, when I went in and I started to study, the, the works that had been published were simply a catalog of the deities, the names of the deities of the Egyptian religions. Well, this religion had so-and-so for God, and that religion had so-and-so for God. But, but none of them, <clears throat> none of them really explained what it was like for a practitioner of that religion. What was their day like? What was their life like? See? It's, it, to me, it's the equivalent of, in the Catholic Church, we had a uh, we had a little book and it would tell you of each each day of the year it was a feast day for one saint or another. And as children we had this in school and we would open it up at the beginning of the day and it would tell us which which saint's feast day this was and it would tell us a li just a little biographical sketch of that person. But you could no long you could no more understand what it, what it was like to grow up Catholic by by reading the communion of saints than you could understand what it was like to grow up in an Egyptian religion by, by reading the list of deities. And my point is, is that we confuse being able to label or to name something with really understanding it. And there is some understanding that goes beyond the labels and the names. And God is such a thing. God is such a thing. Neti neti, whatever your your name of God is, it's not that. It's not that. It's more than that. As we go through this life experience, you and I, there is more going on in our environment at any given time than we can possibly take in. It's like we're on sensory overload. So we tend to select, we tend to select what we allow in. We tend to allow in things that are familiar. We tend to allow in things that we expect to see. And things that we don't expect to see, even though they may be there, we don't see them. We don't notice them. There was a TV show one time, and it was, it was a live TV show, and they had an audience, and they had a panel of people on the stage. And as they were in the middle of one of the segments, Unbeknownst to anyone uh, in the audience, uh, it, it was prearranged that 
a man would run out across the stage and he would steal someone's purse and he would run back into the back. Of course, it was all, it was all set up by the producer. But the people in the audience had no idea that it was coming. And afterwards, <clears throat> they stopped and they asked people to describe the purse snatcher, to describe what this man looked like. They had all seen the same thing. They were all sitting right there looking at the same thing. And yet there were many, many different descriptions of how tall this person was, how much they weighed, what color clothing they had on, were they wearing a hat, were they wearing gloves, all of these different things. Each person took in different information. And a lot of that information was tainted by what they expected a purse snatcher to look like. So we have to be aware that what we think we see, what we think we have given our vision to, is not necessarily all that there is. It may be biased by our prejudices, by our, our pre-existing notions of the way things are or the way things ought to be. And what we want to do, the reason I, I bring this up is, if we keep looking at the world the same way that we have been looking at the world, if our vision stays, stays turned on to things as they have always appeared to be in the past, then nothing will change. See, we don't have this vision of something better that we're moving forward to. We are keeping our eyes and our vision and our attention on the current reality. And it's Einstein who told us that the definition of insanity was doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. We said, but why do we do what we do? You know, we do what we do because of the decisions we make. The decisions we make, <laughs> we make that because of the information we take in and the way we process it. Any information ta we take in depends on what we put our vision on. So we keep looking at the same stuff over and over and over again and it keeps reappearing in our lives. Looks familiar. You know, it's that deja vu stuff all over again as Yogi Berra said, you know. As the friends say, what goes around comes around. Everything just keeps repeating itself and the reason it keeps repeating itself is, is that our vision, our culture's vision is stuck. It is stuck in the drama of the daily living. It is stuck in the politics. It is stuck in the news. It is stuck in all of the things that we've already done before. As a society, as a world, we've already done all of these things before that they're talking about. The technology may make it a little bit more efficient for us, a little bit more effective, but we've already done these things. So we know as, as metaphysicians, we know as students, that there's a power in the universe that responds unto us according to our belief. What we think and believe, we talked about that the other week, as we think and believe in our hearts, but as we think and believe in our hearts is largely a function of what we have given our vision toward. So we say if you want to have a different experience in life, you need to change your thinking. Well, one way to change your thinking is to change what you're giving your attention to, to change your vision. So I was reading Emma Curtis Hopkins yesterday, and she was talking about inspiration, inspiration. We have respiration, which is breathing, and inspiration, which has to do with receiving knowledge as we draw in our breath. That was, that's what the word inspiration means. An understanding that comes with the inward breath. It right? doesn't come to us through logic or reason. It comes to us some other way. Now the, <clears throat> the word spire, like inspiration, has to do with breath. And the word spirit comes from the same root and it has to do with breath. God is spirit, the breath of the heavens. So what we want to do, if, if you want to think about this, what we want to do is, as we breathe in, we want to breathe in 
the breath of the heavens. We want to be inspired. We want to see a different way. We want to, we want to open our inner vision to a greater possibility of what it is that we are becoming in our lives. And the, the problem we have is we've got our nostrils stuck down into the smog, into the smog of the way things appear to be in the current reality. We leave, lived in Denver in the late 80s, I think like 87 to 91 we were living in Denver. And at the time, in, in the winter, Denver had some of the dirtiest air in the nation. The city itself sits in a little a dip or a bowl down in, a, in the plain on the eastern slope of the Rockies. And when the wind would come from the west and it comes up over the mountains, <clears throat> as air lifts up, it cools. And as air comes back down the eastern slope, it warms. These were the Chinook winds, the snow-eating winds. So this warm air would go over the top of the bowl that Denver sat in, and the air in Denver couldn't rise. It couldn't rise up through this warmer air. So we'd just sit there and get dirtier and dirtier and dirtier. And it, it was terrible. I mean, if we had a meeting in downtown Denver, you would go there, your eyes would burn, your throat, throat would burn, your clothes would be all covered with grime, your cars would be filthy. If you had to go on a trip in the wintertime and left your car at the airport parked outdoors, it was just absolutely covered with grime. So get, get that image, you know, that, that here, here we are, all these people were stuck down into the smog. But if you go just a little bit higher up, if we could raise up above, above the smog of the current reality, we could get our nostrils into clearer air. We could draw in and be inspired. So Emma Curtis Hopkins tells us that what we give our vision towards, we tend to be inspired by. We tend to start to, to draw in ideas that, that lead us to become more like that which we have focused our vision on. You know, you see this in, in sports. A child will grow up and they'll say that, you know, a certain athlete is their hero and and they they give their attention to the athlete until they they begin to mimic them. They begin to play in the same way and try to field the ball the same way and hit the ball the same way and do do all of these things that their athlete does. So what Emma Curtis Hopkins is telling us is, is get your nostrils out of the smog. Draw in the clear air of God, the inspiration of God. Turn your eyes unto the hills. Look at me, says the Bible, look at me. So if we can, if we can get our vision, if we can break the habit of being stuck in the way of things appear to be now, into all of the drama, into all of the tragedy, into into all of the politics, into all of these other things that we we can consume our, our entire day just worrying about. And if we can break that cycle and we can raise our vision up and contemplate God, what is God? God is good. And if we can contemplate that goodness and if we can keep our vision on that goodness and, and keep our minds still from, from, from trying to label it and trying to weigh it and trying to analyze it and just being in the presence, be still and know, be in the presence. See, then we start to be inspired, then we start to draw in ideas and understanding that lead us into a greater experience of God. So the power of vision is a very important spiritual practice in our lives. And the practice of thanksgiving is a way, a technique, a practice of helping us to keep our eyes on the good. Entirely away from any appearances that are not good. <clears throat> just just leave them be. There's, there's a a passage in the, in the New Testament, you know, where 
where Jesus is calling people to follow him. And one, and one fellow says, well, I'd like to come, but <clears throat> I have to go back home and, and bury my father. Now, in that, in that culture, it didn't mean that his father was dead yet. It meant that his father was old. And this man wanted to go back home and live with his father in the final years of his father's life. He had, he had things to do in, in the current reality, same as we all do. And the answer seemed, seemed cruel. The answer was, let the, let the dead bury their dead, but you come with me now. Let the dead bury their dead. And again, it's, that's a slight mistranslation. It was, let the village bury the dead. In other words, there's going to be people to take care of that. There's going to be people to take care of your father. There's going to be people. When he passes on, there will be people there to, to take care of his funeral. What's more important right now is your spiritual growth. What's more important right now is to come follow me. Come follow me, the Christ, the presence of the divine within. Come follow me right now. Come follow that spiritual growth. And if we put that in the context of today, there's always going to be people to worry about all the drama that's going on in the world. There's people been around forever to worry about it. There'll be people around to worry about it for years to come. But what we don't have a lot of is people who are willing to take their vision out of the current reality and put it onto something greater. So that something greater can come into the world because the people who are stuck in dealing with the current reality aren't going to produce anything much different than what is already there. So we want to take our vision, we want to lift our vision up entirely away to the point where we too behold no iniquities. We too are not caught up in any of that. We are only caught up in the goodness the goodness of God. So gratitude, thanksgiving then, is a spiritual practice by which we stop and pause and we think about this fantastic miracle, this fantastic miracle called life, this fantastic miracle called you. You, the perfect expression of God's love. You, the perfect outpicturing of God's love. And everyone around you Think of the sunrise in the morning. I know that's a powerful time for everyone. When we would go to the beach and do our retreats, uh, everybody loved to get up early in the morning so they could be there and watch the sun come up over the Atlantic. <clears throat> when we were on a cruise ship coming across the ocean, you know, in the morning, a group of people would be, be gathered back on the fantail of the ship in the morning with their coffee, <clears throat> watching, the, watching the sun come up. And the same group of people would be on the bow in the evening with a cocktail watching the sun go down. Something, something magical and something mystical about that, about those two times of the day. And if we think about the miracle of the sunrise, the sun has been there for billions of years. You know? And we're told that the, the protons of light that reach us, when, when the sun comes over the horizon in the morning, and, and the, the light first hits our face. You know. I love the movie, um, I think it was City of Angels with Nicolas Cage. The angels would go to the beach and they could hear music in the sunset. You know. The sun comes over the horizon and the, and the particles of light, the photons of light that come and touch us, we were told began their escape from the sun a million years ago. They bounced around like pinballs inside the sun for a million years before they broke free of the surface. And when they did, it took eight minutes to get here. God put the light in the sunrise a million years ago for you. Only 2% of the sun's energy makes it to the surface of this planet. The rest goes out in all directions in space and misses the planet. Only 2% of the sun's energy reaches this planet and it provides for all of the life as we know it. Can we give thanks? Can we celebrate that? Can we recognize the miracle? If we think of the forms of food on the surface of the earth, you know, we have the animals that eat the grass convert it into, into milk or into flesh and into food. We have rice. We have wheat. We have corn. 
and all of those are forms of grass. The, the, the simple blade of grass that we go out and mow off our lawns has diversified and become major source of food for, for every form of life on this planet. Can we give thanks? Can we celebrate that? Can we go, wow, how amazing is that, you know? The sunshine draws the ocean water up into the clouds and in the process distills it. The sunshine heats the earth quicker than it does the water, causes the air over, over the earth to rise and draws the cooler air in over the ocean. That's why we have the sea breezes all the time and the clouds come with it and they drop their rain over the shore, over the soil to provide us with the water we need. And can we be grateful? Can we see the miracle? Can we feel the goodness that everything in the universe is conspiring to work for us? Nothing in God's plans are conspiring to work against us. It is all good. It is all good. We contemplate the gifts. Can we, can we recognize the people who come into our lives on a daily basis as the very love and presence of God, a gift from God coming to us this day? Now, certainly, everybody doesn't behave that way, but can we lift our eyes up above their behavior? Right? They're only behaving that way because of the way they see and the way they think. And when they see more and they think more, they'll behave differently. Can we recognize them as a beautiful expression of God doing the very best they can, not necessarily the very best they know, but the very best they can right here and right now? Can we greet our loved ones, our beloveds, and bring them into our lives and recognize them and give thanks for them? as beautiful expressions of God who have come into our lives this very day, they have come into our lives to help us to experience the joy, to experience the presence, to experience the love, to experience the unity. So as we go through our day this way, what we're doing is, is we're setting our vision above the smog of current reality. We are raising our vision up to the hills from whence our good comes. We are not just refusing to see the ain't it awfuls, but we don't see them any longer. We don't see them any longer. Our entire focus is on God. Our entire focus is on peace. Our entire focus is on love. And as we draw in inspiration, we are inspired with understanding of God and of peace and of love. That is what we become more of each and every day. This is why a grateful heart is a great heart that eventually attracts to itself great things. This is what casting our bread upon the waters is. This is what tossing out our boomerang is. This is what speaking our word and knowing that it shall not return unto us void is. It is getting our head up, out of the muck, out of the smog, out of the gossip, out of the drama. And it is bringing our intention solely to the good, to the God. So I invite you then, each and every day, each and every day as you awaken, give thanks, for we have another day to love. We have another day to learn. We have another day to grow. We have another day to, to be inspired. And we have another day to inspire others. The food we eat is a gift 
of God. The water we drink is a gift of God. The sunlight that falls upon our skin is a gift of God. The plants that grow, the animals, the forest, the fishes of the sea, the birds of the air, they are all miraculous demonstrations of the order and the harmony and the peace of God. We move our attention from the gifts to the giver. And we just sense the presence. The presence that can be described but can be felt, that can be experienced. We allow it to fill our consciousness, our thoughts, our emotions, our feelings, our consciousness. And to be with us this day to be with us as we go forward as the best expression of God's love we can be this day. What you give your intention to, what you set your vision upon, will draw you to it, will inspire you towards it. And the spiritual practice of thanksgiving, of gratitude, is a way of being sure that you focus your attention on that <clears throat> which you wish to become. You are God's instrument of love and of peace and of joy. And I invite you today, no matter where your vision has been, <clears throat> I invite you to take it up a notch, to raise it a little higher, to know a little bit more of God each and every day. Because no matter how much we have today, there will always be more to live, to learn, to realize, to accept. As we gather to give thanks this year, let's give thanks for our ability, our God-given ability, to cast our eyes upon the hills from whence our helps come, not on the problems, but on the giver of the goodness. And so it is.